Hey, this is Christian Buckley with another MVP Buzz Chat, and I'm talking today with Dennis. Hello. Uh, hi, Christian. Um, I'm. Thanks for inviting me. And it's great uh, to have you. And it's always good to have another Office Apps and Services. We can we can get down in the weeds, talk about the technology or whatever it is. But uh, for folks that don't know you, who are you? Where are you? And what do you do? Um, I'm Dennis Malatsov. I live in Toronto, Canada. I'm mostly focusing on everything related to SharePoint, but I'm also doing lots of Power Apps, Power Automate, and uh, a little bit of Azure here and there whenever a project um, and a client requires that. Well, that's great. So let me ask. So I, I started as a SharePoint MVP as well. So uh, what's your, uh, so when did you start working with SharePoint? It wasn't that long ago, but it's uh, at least 11 years. I've okay. lost count since around 2008. Uh, my first uh, version I remember was SharePoint 2007. Mm -hmm. We call it MOS or uh, WSS. Right. But funny enough, uh, later I saw older versions like SharePoint 2003 and even 2001. Um, so I think I worked with every version of SharePoint by now. Yeah, I think back in that era, you used to ask that question a lot because I just I started three years before you, so 2005 properly, but had started seeing it back in 2004, late 2003, early 2004. Um, but back in that time, in the 2007 and 2010 era, you know, companies that were SharePoint organizations typically had two or three versions of SharePoint running. And for a long time, like the average was two and a half versions, uh, uh, you know, and, and so it was typical until, you know, the mid 2010s to still find um, not much 2003, but still a lot of 2007, which is yeah. crazy. Yeah. It's typical because you could just enable SharePoint as a feature at one point. And uh, in Active Directory, you would have some like a property of that would mark a server as uh, the one that has SharePoint. And you could do discovery to see how many SharePoints you have in your organization. And sometimes you would have more than 10. Um, and this is actually still happening. Um, not that you keep getting them on purpose. But there are some organizations, including the ones I worked for, that have at least 10 on-premise SharePoint farms, maybe 20, if you include a dev and staging ones. Well, it's, it's it, I, I think Microsoft has stopped kind of tracking how much on-prem is, is out there. I, I think that it's uh, one thing, it's certainly accelerated the move to the cloud and SharePoint online and kind of the other workloads. It's certainly speeding up. And we're running into now, if, if you're starting a company, you have board in the cloud companies and that are all the SaaS offerings. And no one would think about going now, starting a company, starting a business and deploying an on-prem solution like a SharePoint server. Uh, but I, I think people would be surprised by how much on-prem there still is. Uh, there, there is a lot. In fact, they're um, working for an ISV that does migration and does backup and does you know, has products for on-prem as well as uh, all the cloud. Uh, you know, we run into massive customers that still have, uh, you know, it's, it's um, you know, dark accounts. So they've not yet moved entirely. They have some cloud services, but they're still largely on-prem. And those organizations typically have two or three versions of SharePoint. Yeah. And that's not because they're uh, not trendy or they don't want to migrate, but some maybe are. I've noticed that uh, you can't necessarily migrate everything. It's not lift and shift. Mm -hmm. So companies that commit to, to the cloud, even those uh, in many cases cannot just move everything because they have years, if not decades of customizations that they invested in. Yep. Um, and I'm still dealing with these and trying to move. And that will probably take years, if not a another decade. 
Yeah, for everybody who's in uh, on the services, you're working for an MSP or working for a consulting company. I mean, there's a there's a lot of money to be made in migration as a service and just specializing, doing nothing but move. In fact, we have partners. I was just on a call last night and uh, it, you know, it, where everybody on the call is just like, yep, doing tons of these, like daily dealing with migrations with customers. Yep. Uh, yeah. I have I have the same experience. Oh, lots of uh, I have got maybe two or three requests to help with a large migration per half a year or three months. I've even developed a migration dashboard that helps with uh, to track migrations. Oh. I'm not sure if you saw it, uh, but on uh, it's a project on GitHub. The okay. migration dashboard. Uh, is a kind of centralized tracking SharePoint SPFX web part. And it so shows every site collection in your farm and the status um, that explains when it's migrated or when it will be migrated. Well, I see it now looking at, and I'll provide the link in the blog post uh, as well. But yeah, if you go to Dennis's uh, uh, GitHub page and it's in the pinned, it's the, you know, right there on the top on the right, the SharePoint migration dashboard. You go take a look at that and number mm -hmm. of other projects there. So, so easy fairly, to find. Fairly easy to set up. Uh, there is a tutorial that explains how to do it. The hardest part usually is to get data displayed because you know how many projects, migration projects happen. They usually don't have any tracking at all, or if they do, you have something like an Excel file. Mm -hmm. So instead, you could generate the uh, the content for the dashboard so that you don't start from scratch. You would run a SMAT tool or SharePoint migration tool. It's a free uh, analysis tool provided by Microsoft. Mm -hmm. It gets you that uh, meet the data that you would then display through the dashboard. So all you have to do is just grab that um, output from SMAT and feed it to, to the dashboard and it just shows the data that you can start tracking, which hopefully sounds easy, which it is. Well, that's, that, that's what MVPs do. We make it sound all so easy. You just do this and a couple clicks later, there you go. It breaks. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, that's shh. <laughs> Right. <laughs> well, that's that's very cool. So, what else are you uh, like passionate about right now? What are you actively writing, speaking on, talking about? Um, well, usually I don't have a focus on just one topic. I really like the breadth of um, to to kind of increase the breadth of my expertise. Mm -hmm. um, let's say mm, several years ago, I was trying to focus to learn everything about SharePoint on premises. Hmm. And I, I remember starting with crazy things like opening, you know, central administration and trying to make sure I know every single menu item uh, is understood. Oh, every button I click, I, I wanted to know what this would do. Mm -hmm. So, and I did the same for SharePoint Online and uh, then I did for other things. So like power apps, uh, canvas apps. And uh, what it does is that I, I end up with a lot of useless knowledge that I never use, but I still like kind of learning what's possible uh, to achieve. Uh, for example, uh, you could use SharePoint um, uh, list formatting. And many people know, well, first of all, most people don't know it exists. But then you have a category of people who know it exists, but they don't know to which extent. They don't realize how vastly powerful this feature is. So I'm trying to uh, spend time learning what's possible. And then I'm just waiting for that opportunity to, to arise whenever there is a project or a need to use it. And when a need arises, I'm just trying to, to I take lots of notes. So whenever I research something and then I just whenever somebody asks me for something, I, I know, aha, I know how to use it in SharePoint or I know for sure it's not possible. Right. And then I recommend something else. 
So this is, I don't know if it explains what my passion is, but I'm trying to learn as much as possible about the full list of features and just try to keep up to date with, with them. One of the ways I, I used to do it and still do is uh, answering questions on, on SharePoint Stack Exchange. Mm -hmm. Because there are questions that you don't necessarily think about or need for your work, but that helps because the breadth, the real uh, list of real world questions is visible not at your work because it's just a tiny circle right. of the entire world. You see the real problems that lots of people experience if you mingle with them and listen to 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 what they're asking for. Well, and I, so I, I participate in a lot of I do a lot of AMAs. And if you look at my blog, I've got mm -hmm. a group of people. There's about 15 to 20 of us. And we get together in small kind of pods and and do these recordings. And a couple of things that you find out, like answering questions raw that are coming from tech community or Facebook groups or LinkedIn groups where people are posting questions is that everybody knows a little bit, but kind of to your point, we often come from different perspectives. So something which sometimes I think, hey, that's a pretty straightforward answer. And here's the information, what you go and do. And somebody says, well, unless you're using a Mac or, hey, I had this, this experience with this same problem from an industry perspective and here's how we solved it. It's fascinating to you. So you expand your knowledge that way. Same thing. You see different perspectives of the problem yeah. by, by going and do that research. And sometimes we get things that we're like, yeah, I really like the question and nobody is part of the group. Nobody knows the answer. We'll all go and kind of research it as well. And so, and find out the answers and then come back and talk about it. Mm -hmm. But I, I love that, that process, the community learning experience, the collaborative, you know, learning experience. Yeah, me too. So uh, whenever uh, somebody asks the question, what I usually like is to make sure not only that one person gets the answer, but it's captured somewhere. This is why I like forums. Mm -hmm. um, because it's just there waiting to be discovered by a struggling Googler facing the same problem. Well, that's why, and too, the, the tools, I mean, you're right. I mean, I remember, uh, you know, message boards and back in the late 80s, early 90s, and you know, actually paying for uh, Bolton board services to get access yeah. to different areas for technical learning. Uh, and then kind of the early versions of knowledge management systems and collecting that. And the tools have gotten smarter and, again, more collaborative where people can vote up the best answers and, you know, things like that. And I found occasionally, it's rare, but found what people are voting up was a wrong answer and going in and trying to correct that as well. It's like, uh, it's like the running joke about Wikipedia, uh, you know, being the, the, the a centralized source of knowledge and there's so much incorrect information that's in Wikipedia. Um, but it's great to have those perspectives um, and to have input from different people. And, uh, and again, usually you get more information around the topic than you would otherwise go and find from a single source. This is, this is actually a fascinating uh, topic and comment that you mentioned when um, some wrong answers are upvoted or maybe uh, most of them, and I noticed a, I noticed that different sites work differently. For mm -hmm. example, I've noticed Reddit is one of those. If you are looking for something related to SharePoint, uh, maybe Power Apps, Power Automate, Reddit is the last place you want to go. But yet people go there in droves, yep. and most upvoted answers are wrong. In SharePoint Stack Exchange, that's not the case. I I, I see there, and I, I'm just I see that most upvoted answers are are the, the good ones. Well, you do have the added benefit is where you have Microsoft people, other like you know uh, certified experts in that that participate within that that skew the results. It's I mean this is a in the broader topic. I mean. Uh, I knew a person, worked with the person who was uh, had a, a doctorate level degree in 
survey science. Fascinating, getting in there, looking at the the science and the sociology behind like how people answer surveys, how people participate, and how they respond. You know, and and things like um, there was a study. This research is like over ten years old, but they were looking at um, like some uh, back with when AOL was still big, but some analysis on that. What they found is that if there was your know, two answers and one had more clicks, more likes, more upvotes, people were predisposed to then click and add to that. And that's where you get like a wrong answer that can grow, even though the ones that I really know are, are there. And so that's why things like giving uh, you know, people who are authoritative on a topic more weight in their answers on that, you know, and, and in, in a, a a managed platform, you know, can change the way people react to answers and data. So, um, yeah, it, it's uh, that's that's one of those things where like democracy, pure democracy, is not always a good thing for the answers thing because you the crowd can be wrong. Yeah, yeah, if you if you give an amazing tool to a crowd a crowd that doesn't know anything about this tool or technology, they're then the tool won't do much you right, know it right. might even shoot uh, they might shoot themselves in the foot using that tool but if the community is there and some communities are amazing for example i really like the communities on the power platform uh websites uh, hosted by uh, microsoft mm -hmm. the, the, to be honest with you the kind of technology the website itself feels a little bit um not great, but the people who see there are amazing. I, I I ask there lots of questions myself, try to answer lots of them, and the help you get is is amazing. And also, it's funny because you see, you know, people like teachers, you know, mm -hmm. uh, people who have their own businesses, accountants ask questions. Mm -hmm. This mm -hmm. is usually like you would get these questions from these people sometimes on the SharePoint forums, but it was rare. When it comes to Power Apps, Power Automate, you have lots of questions from these. Like I was answering some questions that a nurse asked when the pandemic was just starting. And it was just great. Uh, it's, um, I don't know about the upvoting part because I, I don't pay attention to, to that part on, on that site, on the uh, Power Platform Community Forum. I think they have kudos and likes, but you don't yeah. get answers kind of bubble up to the top if right. something is heavily liked that that's not happening. Yeah. But I was just going to say that, you know, it's interesting that kind of how you phrase it, the the, the observation that, um, you know, the, the, the last time where we've seen this same kind of, uh, you know, every person out there, you know, jumping in, asking questions across multiple industries, different levels of technical capability. Mm -hmm. You saw some of that. And it's it's kind of the, I mean, some people call it like the citizen developer world, others that call it like the maker community, you know, for, for online tools. But we saw some level with like InfoPath and, and uh, 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 to some degree with, um, uh, you know, some of the other lightweight tools um, that uh, where, where anybody could go in and, and build some simple automations, you, know, you didn't see that within the SharePoint space as much as you do now with Power Platform. And, uh, and so it really is evolving and changing the makeup of who is in there sharing their experiences. It's, it's pretty exciting that way. There are some great stories and Microsoft pulls them in for their events of, you know, somebody who there's a case study of what is it? It's, um, it's the, uh, out of, um, there's a great story set of stories of somebody who, um, worked for, uh, the, uh, airport at, uh, within London and just was doing something non-tech related, but, uh, just had kind of a passion following along to technology had a problem at work, said, yeah, I'm going to go see if I could fix this. And now has built a career for themselves in building power apps and automating many other aspects that have been, uh, you know, um, 
utilized across the you know the company um so that's you, you have life-changing stories that are happening of, of non-technical people kind of finding a path into technology that's pretty dang cool yeah i agree it sounds like these um technologies um they, they become almost like new excel or new um access yeah uh, database because that's where non-developers used to do lots of uh, automation and maybe shadow IT. Uh, yeah. But uh, Power Apps now becomes something of a like a must-have skill. Not maybe this year, but the trend is going that on your resume, you would rather have as an office worker, not just Excel, but you would right. want to mention, like, I can build like a, a basic power app or I can so, use power automate. It's also why you're seeing an increase in interest from companies uh, around the topic of governance of power platform. And are we doing this in a safe and scalable and sustainable way um, that's not going to cause problems later? So that's a very hot topic right now. And I know that it's... Uh, ISV solutions, Microsoft is looking at solutions um, around that area as well because it's growing so quickly i love this topic too but uh I, it's very controversial because in the past you could open let's say an excel file and build the visual basic you know formulas there and no one would know and no one would say anything but with power atom automate it's kind of the same thing but your power app is stored in the cloud and now suddenly everyone cares. What does it do exactly? Like, right. um, I, I think uh, you shouldn't worry too much about this, but there are some concerns uh, like DLP. Does it, is it secure? Do you build something too large to fail? <laughs> is it an app that is well, used that, by hundreds of people? And Well, that and that, there you go. I mean, is it something that, hey, for your role, for your focus within your team, for doing your job, you're building it, which is, you know, was some of the the way that it was kind of sold initially of, hey, this is what you can go and do. You don't have to go through IT. You can go build this solution. But then it, it kind of just harkens back to the experience with SharePoint. Uh, I, I'll use the, the phrase, it infected a lot of organizations where early on where people would go and not ask permission. It was a shadow IT initiative and so many yeah. different companies. They would go and build things and build reporting off of it and then show it to the leadership team. It would be like, let's do more of that thing. And then suddenly something that was installed without IT oversight on a, on a server, on a PC, you know, below somebody's desk, the executive team is saying, make this supportable across the organization. Then they're thinking about scalability. Like you don't, you have some similar problems with suddenly scaling up solutions. Was it architected the base way, the best way? Was is it utilizing the right resources? Do the right people have access to it? If I go and I build a solution and then I leave the company, do I still have a backdoor access in? Does somebody else know to, to take it over? What needs to feed it if it's now being dependent on? I mean, there's just a lot of questions that should be answered about solutions that are used by the business period yes yes and i can add to that um the people what's happening right now is that to be honest and you are aware of it is 99 percent, if not more of every company that use uses power platform i i don't i'm not talking about power bi just right. power apps power automate they don't have governance or it's so uh, limited that they um, they can control uh, all right. aspects of what they actually want to control. And it's not easy to start um, doing without a maybe an expensive tool or spending a year or two develop, uh, to develop something homegrown. Um, that involves massive efforts. I, I've seen, I was in, in, gov in power platform governance uh, teams and I know the amount of work that needs to be done. Um, there is a COE starter kit that does lots of. Which is a great uh, place to start, right? The Center the, of Excellence starter kit that Microsoft has, that should be the place where if you yeah. don't have a plan, 
if you've not thought about like start still there. need to st you still at least need to install it right. although you'll deal with upgrades which is not easy to do with this tool yeah um and the, it's funny because this tool does lots of work and it's still called starter kit you know just that gives you an idea how vast the governance uh is and what need, needs to be done yeah. imagine you get get any person an ability to create a database and a server and a website that's what a power app is it's not as scary but technically in terms of features that's what you get yeah. now try to stop them from doing their job you know i i i often i reference that you know that back to why uh lotus notes was so pervasive and how organizations that even hated lotus notes and wanted to get rid of it had such a difficult time getting rid of it was because these small database driven applications that would go and that became so relied upon and so highly customized and you couldn't just go rip it wasn't just like an exchange server and it's just email based it was so tied into everything that these organizations did and you had to go and recreate them so that's why having some semblance of organization of governance layer of management of these things a review process of what is being done and and having some level of oversight you have to balance that too to you don't want to get in the way of people innovating and solving problems for other like that's why you want them to build those things but it needs to be done around standards there need to be you know guardrails up around um, how you go build things yeah i would i would call it um uh, falling into a pit of success if i recall this phrase correctly <laughs> currently yeah. there is no pit re ready and waiting for you to fall into right so creating a nice um environment governance is is hard and it's proactive you need to constantly do it, it right. there is nothing you can uh turn on like a, you can't flip a switch to to get good governance. We're governed. We're well governed yeah. now. We flipped well, the switch. <laughs> That's right. There was a checklist. We we marked it down. We're we're done. Yeah. Mm -hmm, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Currently, it's not easy. For example, just a very practical example: when a user needs to create an app, they would go to you know Power Apps, click Create, and voila, they are they have an app. But what would actually uh, be great <laughs> um and that maybe if somebody from microsoft uh, listens to this uh maybe it would be great to be met with a screen that explains the rules the governance um you know ask questions what are you trying to build currently there is no way for an organization to inject their governance their rules in before. like a like a provisioning process yeah, what you put that in place when you create a SharePoint site, a, yeah. a, a team site, or 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 the provisioning else. process right. is, does not let a company uh, change it in any way. What happens is that you let a person create an app or solution first, and then you chase a person who created it, and then explain after the fact that they used the wrong environment or they were not um or they did it in um like they were not supposed to let's say use dataverse mm -hmm. um and that if that was an option i think that would greatly reduce the governance um you know headache that we currently have to deal with but i i believe uh, even if we don't have that you know pit of success to fall into it um, the amount of good a quick power app or uh, or power automate flow can do is, is it outweighs some governance headaches because business needs to do their job yeah right and they uh they need a, something that works quickly and uh th that's what they use and that's great uh, yeah you can do uh you can deal with the governments later uh, but again, it's just the benefit outweighs the um, the concerns. You can say, you know what, I'm not gonna give anyone license for Power App just to avoid the governance uh, aftermath. So I would say let it work, enable 
let, give everyone license and uh, just just let them create it and then figure it out later. That's all. Not that's not because I'm I'm saying uh, governance is bad. Is that people spend years trying to figure out the power platform governance, and they still uh, can't control it very well. And what I'm saying, you, you'll figure it out. Just just let let uh, people create their apps. Right. You. It goes back to that. You, you don't want to get in the way of people going and innovating. That's the wrong approach. Imagine just, you disabled. There's just a cost. There's just a yeah. cost to going having that success, and that is to after the fact going through and having some degree of oversight and review the, those things. That just that's just part of the cost. I, I was just going to make the joke before we move on of that. Uh, I said I prefer to stay on the higher ground of non-success rather than create the pit of <laughs> success to fall yeah. into. But <laughs> yeah, yeah. Anyway. <laughs> But when it comes to power platform, you know, so, <laughs> but uh, yeah, anyway, but yeah, having some after the fact governance is, I, I, yeah, right now, at least that's the only way until we see, you know, Microsoft goes and innovate something. And uh, like I mentioned, has some kind of provisioning process that you're going to create a new application that it goes through, a, a, you know, a company. Uh, you know, organized a kind of a checklist of, you know, what is it, what category, and, and then, I mean, almost like, like, you know, a home builder um, going in and having to have at certain stages, the city or county or district coming in and approving, yes, that was done correctly, okay, move to the next step. Yep, yep, I know it sounds uh, very restrictive, but um you i i argue that you need to have an ability to have it if you don't um well you 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 uh you end up with the current state where a person creates first and then you ask them can you please move your solution to another environment and now it can be easy easily done but not not always maybe they're created their apps as a standalone app which is very likely yeah um but well, if you first ask them questions, uh, like what what are you building? Like how many people will use it? Do you need to share? I had a I had several cases where uh, there were organizations that allowed sharing with everyone in the organization. They just disable this um, mm -hmm. ability. A person builds an app that spent weeks hoping that they would just share it with everyone. Only later learned that they can't. And then uh, they would be able to eventually do it, but then uh, they would discover that, you know, yeah, apps that share with everyone need to be moved to that specific environment, but you need to provision it. But in order to provision it, you need to get approval. Right. You know, in a year, you'll get your environment. Well, and, there's, uh, yeah, th there's, um, you know, having a, a process. Well, like one, so the people have suggested, well, uh, you can have people that are have like uh, different levels of trust, allow anybody to go in and build rudimentary things, but limit the scope, the reach of the solutions that they're able to do. But um, maybe you have a review process for somebody like me that's at the beginning of their journey in Power Platform, but people who have built multiple and correct and scalable solutions that have more experience, you give them, it's like having, you know, permissions, uh, you have a higher level of permissions, they you allow them more leeway in the solutions because they understand, you know, how to go and architect a scalable solution. So there's, there's ways that you can approach that with junior mid and senior people and their capabilities based on their. Exactly. And this is profile. where yeah. it makes sense to first let person practice with this, right? right? But where are you, practicing when you're talking about access and production system live environments that's what i'm talking about <laughs> you create your test apps right. right in the environment in the direct so production environment but you might say so what it doesn't do any harm true but the person who does the review of hundreds and thousands of apps sometimes it will be tens of thousands in a few years for some organizations yeah. just because people clicked create uh, several times uh that will add up and now you would need to track the owners of these apps who don't maybe exist they need to you need to know if these apps used 
etc etc partially the starter kit does it for you but large numbers uh, make it difficult one thing when you have a hundred apps another uh, case when you have 10,000 flows and 5,000 apps that makes it extremely difficult so yeah. if we had something like a sandbox environment for tests separately then that also would be great well, no, we, we've gone down a path talking about this. I could talk about governance and, and, and thoughts around this. This is a topic mm -hmm. I'm passionate about, written right, about for years and years. But for Dennis, for, for folks that want to you know, contact you or reach out to you or connect with you, what are the best ways to reach you? Do you have a blog to point people to? So, yeah, I, have, I used to have a blog, but I don't want to advertise it because it's uh, old and ugly. But <laughs> I encourage everyone who... Uh, who likes LinkedIn, I like LinkedIn. Uh, just add me on LinkedIn. My name is Dennis Polotsov. You can select search by keyword SharePoint or Microsoft 365. You'll find me very quickly. Uh, I also have a, um, I have GitHub and Twitter and a YouTube channel. Uh, thing, the thing is, if you find me anywhere, you will be able to find the other resources. So if you, if you find me on LinkedIn, you'll see my other resources. If you want to find me on, let's say, GitHub or Twitter, mm -hmm. my hashtag is hard to pronounce, but it's Zerg, Zerg uh, 00S or Zergus. Um, well, I'll have the links, of course, to your social you know, within the, uh, the YouTube page as well as on the blog post with all these other links. Yeah, yeah probably the best places we talked about earlier. Go Definitely go check out his GitHub see his pin solutions there, check out the migration dashboard. Need to go take a look at that myself. Mm -hmm. And uh, Dennis, really appreciate your time. And uh, thanks for uh, joining and doing an MVP Buzz Chat. Thanks, Christian. It was great chatting with you. Ah!